Thank you, everyone, for coming today. I think it's very important in a self-regulated profession that the regulated you participate in your self-regulation. So I ask you to come back again next year, and I ask each of you to bring with you a colleague who's not here this year. It seems to be the practice that the incoming president will give a, a little background as to who they are, and uh, so that you would know what they're all about and where they might be going. I will do the same today. Also, I intend to just highlight uh, where we are as a regulator, what we have done as a society, uh, just as an adjunct to what President Perry has told you in her report, because that is very important as to where we're going. And then I'd like to highlight where I think that we are going, so you'd be aware. I grew up in Sydney, one of two children of hard-working Cape Bretoners. My parents did not have higher education, but they knew the value of higher education, and they encouraged and enabled my sister and I to obtain higher education. There were no lawyers in my family. In fact, when I graduated from, law, from high school, I had had no exposure to lawyers whatsoever. My only exposure to the law was what I saw on TV. And I think growing up in Cape Breton, that was probably an accomplishment in itself. <laughs> I studied business and commerce in university, which was natural, I think, for me, because uh, I was never employed. I've always had my own little business growing up and uh, going through university. And that probably wasn't by choice, that was by necessity. Because when I grew up in Cape Breton, there were no help wanted signs anywhere. You had to fend for yourself. I carried with me through my undergrad a keen interest in law, and whenever there was a law course, I took that law course. And then while during, in the midst of exams at Dalhousie University, I took a friend for a ride on a motorcycle to drop him off. On the return trip, I was involved in a motorcycle accident. This led me to Craig Garson, a then future president. And you might say, I can know what you're thinking right now. In your informative years, you were introduced to Craig Garrison, and you still became a lawyer. <laughs> well, I'll have you know that Mr. Garrison represented your profession, our profession, very well. I did not know that I had any legal rights. It was at the urging of someone I met in the other bed in the hospital that I see Mr. Garrison, and he informed me that I had some legal rights and that there were remedies available for me. But I couldn't afford those remedies. I was in university with the help of my parents and what I had, we could pay for university, but there was nothing else. Nonetheless, Mr. Garson knew that I had legal rights, encouraged me to uh, pursue those legal rights and offered to do the work. And as he said, he would get paid when he won. Well, he lost. He still, he lost that trial and uh, he still felt that, uh, uh, he felt the decision was wrong and I, had a, and I had a legal entitlement to a remedy. I couldn't afford to finance an appeal, but he still took it on. The result of that is that the Baxter case became what was probably the leading left-hand turn case in the country at that time. <laughs> I found that an incredibly interesting experience and I actually got to meet a lawyer, work with a lawyer, see what a lawyer does, exposure to the legal system, and in my case, it was a good experience. I became keenly interested in the law, but I wasn't quite sure whether that was for me, if that's what my future should be. Then I got paid, and then Craig got paid. I saw Craig's bill. I decided I was going to law school. <laughs> I went to UMB Law School. Actually, I intended to go to University of Victoria where P President Perry has gone. Uh, I was accepted at both UMB and, and uh, U of Vic, and I was uh, heading out to U of Vic. Got as far as Fredericton, was a little tired, pulled in, looked at the university, met some very nice people, thought that I had drove far enough, and I <laughs> enrolled. As a law, after the, at the first year, my first summer after law school, I thought it was probably important that I work in a law firm. I returned to Sydney. And uh, I met George Cater of Cater and Cater. He and his father, Simon, were, were still practicing at that time. And I was offered a job. I decided I wasn't going to take that job from Mr. Cater. I was going to accept another offer. But I thought the prudent thing to do would be to show up at Mr. Cater's office and tell him in person that I wasn't going to accept his job. He didn't accept my decline. <laughs> in fact, he immediately gave me some work and wouldn't let me leave without doing the work. 
So I had to make a phone call to decline the other offer because I certainly didn't want to go try to do that in person again and have two jobs. <laughs> I'm glad that George Cater didn't let me leave. I learned a lot from George over those two summers. He exposed me to the practice of law and in a, in a small firm, in a small community, there was a lot to learn from both he and the, all, and the other lawyers that were there. What I learned is that it's very important to provide value to clients. After law school, I decided I wanted to be a tax lawyer. So I deliberately sought out Mr. Edwin Harris. Thank you for coming today, Ed. And I joined, as an article clerk, Daily Black and Marrera, a medium-sized firm in Halifax. I learned a lot at that firm. Most importantly, I think that I learned professionalism from the stellar lawyers at that firm. And I see Kelly Greenwood is here today, who was one of the lawyers I practiced with. After five years of practice, I wanted to provide value to clients in a way somewhat different than the traditional law firm does. I guess you could say that in my time, I was innovative. So together with another tax lawyer, I started a boutique tax firm, Baxter Harris. Very quickly learned the business aspect of the practice of law. It wasn't theory, it was very real. 10 years later, we found ourselves the victims of our own success. We have grown from three bodies in that boutique firm to 21 bodies. The day-to-day -day management of a law office started to consume the time, all our time. We were at that awkward size where we needed professional management, but we couldn't afford professional management. So the move to McGinnis Cooper was actually a natural move. There was lots of support, and, in, and again, it was the successor of Daily Black and Marrera, and so I was very comfortable with the lawyers there. It has been a great experience. It's been almost 10 years that I've been at that firm now. And I've had the benefit of seeing how a large firm, a large regional firm operates. And in fact, I have been a member of the board of directors of that firm for six years. So I continue to see the business and practice challenges faced by law firms. So I have been a client that was in need of legal services. I've had the good practice uh, I had the good fortune to practice in a small firm in a small community. I practiced in a medium-sized firm in a bigger community. I operated my own small tax law boutique, and I am now a member and have experience with a large regional firm. Although each of these business models strive to achieve the same objective, providing value to clients, they do so in different ways and they face very different, unique challenges, and they have their own unique rewards. I've learned three fundamental things about a successful practice. In order to be successful, one, professionalism. You must be professional in all you do as a lawyer. Two, providing value to clients. It's all about the clients. And three, innovation. Never stop finding new ways to provide value. So, this brings me to where we are today as a regulator. The Nova Scotia Barrister Society is the self-regulator of the legal profession. Our mandate is to regulate the practice of law in the public interest. And as you heard from President Perry, to this end, we have completed a three-year strategic plan. Two tenements of that plan were excellence in regulation and governance and enhancing access to legal services and the justice system. And as President Perry has said over and over again, although these two are expressed separately, they are not wholly independent. Elements of each are woven through the other. I'm pleased to report and concur with President Perry's assessment that we have made great headway in both of these aspects. We have identified that just as the world is changing in a rapid pace, we need to adapt and change the way we regulate. We are trying to keep up with and get ahead of changes affecting our profession. And we recognize the need for enhanced access to legal services. And we're trying to be very innovative. Escape. Sean said to me to escape. He either means run away or... <laughs> there we go. It's too late. 
So I just want to highlight some of the accomplishments and where we are because it's going to be very important in where we're going. So first, we have adopted six regulatory objectives, which should now be up there for you to see. These regulatory objectives drive every aspect of what we do as a regulator. We test everything we do by these regulatory objectives. We now take an evidence-based approach to our decision making. We don't just do things. There must be evidence as why we should do things or how we should do things. We have built a foundation for an outcomes-focused regulatory model. Soon we will be rolling out a pilot project for the MSELF management system for ethical legal practice. Our goal is to improve the quality and ethical legal practice. We've already adopted, in the way we operate, a triple P approach to regulation. Proactive, principled, and proportionate. Risk identification and management is now a priority and will be built into our decision-making processes. This will dramatically change the way that we think and the way that we approach regulation. We'll be asking ourselves, where is the evil? What is the risk to the public? The risk factors that will be considered by the society will be disclosed. The intent is there will be complete transparency so you'll know the basis upon which we are making our decisions. All this represents a dramatic change in the way that we regulate. It's dramatic. This is modern regulation for a modern world, for a changing world. Now, we may have the legacy of the way things were done in the past, but that's the past. This is the way that we're operating now. Our progress with regulatory reform has resulted from extensive consultations with the profession. President Perry talked about the consultation process for the MSELF. And I can tell you firsthand that your input matters and does make a difference. The comments and feedback that we got over the last year have morphed the way that the entity regulation approach that we've taken, have morphed us into legal services regulation, and have morphed what's in the MSELF and how that will be worked. Under access to legal services, we are moving towards regulatory changes that will enhance legal services. We decided that we should allow lawyers to do more and to do so in more innovative ways in order to deliver and provide better ways of delivering legal services. We have made it our business to learn how the legal system operates and to advocate for improvements. We advocate for enhanced access to legal services and the justice system for equity seeking and economically disadvantaged groups and we do so by building relationships. President Perry has referred to a few. We have Talk Justice, which is bringing justice players together to identify and solve impediments. We have the Mi'kmaq Family and Children's Services Initiative, and we have the Preston's Land Initiative. We heard directly from the community that, this was, that, the, that land titles was a concern, and we are trying to help. And we work with and will continue to work with justice partners to encourage and enhance access. Three years ago, these relationships didn't exist. We have now learned and we believe that by building relationships with communities and with justice partners, that we can together enhance access to justice for all Nova Scotians. So, what next? Well, all this is just the beginning. It is a good platform and it is the basis for the future of legal services regulation, but much more work is to be done yet. Council is actively working on a new strategic plan for the next number of years. That hasn't been finalized yet, but I think I can give you a look into what it is that we'll likely be dealing with. We will continue with legal services regulation. We will continue working on ways to transform regulation and governance in the public interest. Because it is vital that regulation keep pace what's happening in the changing world. We will implement the, the MSELF, and we'll monitor its progress, and we will adapt accordingly. We will measure everything in accordance with the, our regulatory objectives. Are we achieving those objectives? 
The overall objective of the MSOLF is to change the nature of the conversation between the regulator and a profession. We will be approachable, open, supportive, and responsive in the way we regulate. We will continue to look for ways to enhance the availability of legal services to the public. Our objective is to remove the impediments that the profession may face in providing innovative delivery of legal services. And this may require regulatory reform, and it will be part of our approach to regulatory reform. We will make equity a strategic priority, both in the profession and with regard to access to justice. We will promote diversity and inclusion in every aspect that touches upon our profession. Collaborating and working with equity-seeking communities and the profession as a whole will be key to this initiative. Our objective is to make equity mainstream in all that we do. We receive the report, the financial report from Sean this morning. We recognize that there is a cost in pursuing these initiatives and regulating. And the fiscal reality is this cost is borne by you, the profession. And we know there is a limit to how much we can ask you to contribute. So we recognize that we must be fiscally responsible. We must adapt best practices in the way that we operate. Now this includes considering the cost of any initiative before we embark down that road. And we need to know that the cost is going to be manageable. If it's not, we cannot put at risk our core function. If we can't afford it, we've got to find innovative ways of delivering that initiative. And if we can't find effective ways, find fiscally responsible ways of delivering that initiative, we just may not be able to do that. These are big decisions that your council will have to make. Last year, President Perry reminded us that self-regulation requires the active participation of the members of the profession. As she put it, the self in self-regulation. She'd said then that self-regulation works best when the regulated are engaged. Well, we saw that with the MSELF consultations. Collaboration and consultation will continue to be one of the cornerstones, cornerstones, excuse me, cornerstones to our regulatory reform. In this vein, I have two immediate requests of you. In the next few months, we'll be rolling out the MSELF pilot project and we'll be looking for lawyers and law firms to volunteer to participate. I'm asking that you seriously consider participating in this initiative. Your feedback will be crucial in forming future regulation. Second, we need to do some further work to adapt the MSELF to legal entities and lawyers who are not in private practice. It is likely that we're going to need to put together a working group along these lines. I encourage you to consider participating in that working group. Finally, there are a number of fundamental regulatory matters that are likely to become before Council in the next one, two, or three years. It is very important that you keep yourself informed of these matters and that you participate and speak up. Otherwise, you risk waking up one morning and discovering that your profession has changed overnight and the way that you're regulated has changed overnight. I'll just give you a flavor of some of the things that I expect are going to be coming before your council. Four examples. One, should we adapt the regulation of paralegals in Nova Scotia? Will this help enhance access to legal services, affordable access to legal services? If we do, it probably means that paralegals can provide legal services without any lawyer supervision. 
And it probably means that paralegals can operate independent of lawyers. The question for the Bar Society as the regulated profession in the uh, public interest is whether or not this is in the public interest. Will this enhance access to legal services? How should counsel be populated? That's the second question I think is going to come before us. Should we have more public representatives? Should there be more public representatives than lawyers on council? Should lawyers continue to be elected? Or should they be appointed? If they be appointed, what should be the criteria for the appointment? And who should make the appointment? Third, we may even have the question as to whether or not we should continue to be self-regulated. Look what's happened in the UK. Lawyers are no longer self-regulated in the UK. This is a question that regulators across the world and across our country will be facing. Fourth, council has before it a motion right now, the effect of which, if passed, would remove the reservation for the delivery of legal services to lawyers alone. If passed, this means that there would be no restriction in who can provide legal services in the province. A person who is not a lawyer, but presumably having a sufficient degree of experience in a narrow area, would be permitted to be in the business of providing legal services to the public. There would no longer be the concept of unauthorized practice. Lawyers would continue to be regulated, but now the public would have the option to receive legal services from regulated lawyers or to receive legal services from others. So the question for counsel is, is this in the public interest? Will this enha enhance access to legal services that are needed by so many? What is the risk? Does the risk outweigh the benefit? So these are some big questions before your counsel. I hope I got your attention. You know, there are issues that regulators are considering across the country like these and others and will come before your regulator. If you have a view, then you should participate. You should inform yourself, educate, and participate in your own self-regulation by making your views known. I do emphasize, however, we're not looking for knee-jerk reactions. We're asking you to fully consider the objectives and what's being proposed and whether it's in the public interest. And everything we do will be measured by our regulatory objectives. So as part of a self-regulated profession, your participation is key. I look forward to hearing from you and collaborating with you over the next year. Thank you.